If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and hit the subscribe button as well as the bell to be notified of future videos. Thank you. Hello Internet. I must introduce you to some soldier, otherwise he wouldn't be here. Businessman, entrepreneur, also involved with wildlife. He's a fantastic fellow. I spoke to him quite a few times now before we're recording this. His name is Diedrich van Hof. And would you believe with that Dutch signing, signing name, he was actually a major in the Transvaal Scottish. And he says to me, he met the Queen Mother at the palace, at Buckingham Palace in uh, London, in uniform. And, and that makes it very special, in fact, because, you know, you don't often see South African Army uniforms in London, not since the Second World War, I would suppose. But we're going to get to all of this, and then I must also tell you he's got an app. An application, as we call it. Yes, yeah, one of those things you download, you know, onto your phone and, and it assists you. And that's why he's here, because his app is fantastic. It has to do with history, military history. And you just have to look at this fellow. Once he starts speaking, you'll see this library behind him. And you will see, here's a guy who can speak history like no other. So very welcome here, yeah, Major. We're really grateful for you. Thank you for coming. I want to... Um, can you tell us, how did this start for you? How do you go from a Dutchman to a Transvaal Scottish? And I don't even know where to start, so I'll leave it for you. Yeah, I'm, hi, thank, thanks for coming and thanks for inviting me. This is, this is going to, I think it's going to be a lot of fun on this one. Yeah, how does a, how does a proper cast corp wind up in the Transvaal Scottish? First generation South African, my parents emigrated out of Holland after World War II. They just couldn't see it anymore. The Germans, the Germans really hammered the Netherlands. My father had enough. Two of his brothers, two of my uncles were shot by the Germans because they didn't want to fight in the German army. And he just had enough. So he came out to South Africa. And uh, yeah, that's where that's where we come from. So early 1950s, he came out. And yeah, South Africa, I'm born and bred here with a Dutch surname. I was part of the conscription. I went in, matriculated 81 Call up papers arrive, off we go to Poch Infantry, fill, fill in the little Ned Bank books, all that good stuff that I think we all went through. And uh wound up in in yeah, we wound up we wound up in Poch. And the army that year made a complete remorse of the call up. In nineteen eighty two, I think every infantryman wound up in Poch. So one side, two side, three side, four side, six side, eight side, all wound up in Poch. So it was a hell of a scuttle to get that sorted out. And uh Eventually, we did basics in Middleburg, and I had no ambition to do much in the army at that stage. I just thought, let me get my two years done, and uh, I sat in my first tent on the shooting range in Poch. The oak next to me had a standard eight out of Durban. The first thing he did was organize a bag of duck and smoke himself into a stupor, and we were all panicking in the tent because we think the corporal and I are going to arrest us. Had an oak across the aisle from me with a standard. I think he had a standard three. Worked on the railways as a guy. Tapped the wheels on the trains, and I thought, no, 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 no. I can't. I, there's no ways I'm going to survive two years of this. So we go to infantry school. Do my year down at infantry school. Interesting times. I volunteered there as a assault pioneer. So off to Kronstadt to do the engineering training. Border duty was digging landmines out of Wimvelisa Park. Exciting times. We I managed to lift one of those mines. There was a, we we got one. It was a Czechoslovakian thing, a PTMB two something. I forget the name. Bakelite box mine. That you're sitting there with the earphones and peep peep peep, and you're doing ninety nine percent of the time it's a Coca Cola can and a nail and a, a screwy out of a buffalo or something or suspension or a square wheel. But that day we hit a mine. Dig this thing out, signal, saying, what? Wow, everybody goes in Rondon for Dierachang, the whole lot, and here we go digging out this bloody mine. And we clear it. I managed to clear the mine, and at that stage, the technique was to throw a grappling hook behind it, and then you fall back, because if you wrap it on your arms, it'll pull your arm off. It'll, you'll, you'll kill yourself. So we go back there, I don't know, 50, 60, 80 meters, whatever the safety distance was. I can't remember. It's an awful long time ago. 
But we pull that mine. That mine comes out of the ground, but just behind it, on the in the, in the middle maniki almost, because you got the track in your middle maniki, next track in the middle of the thing. Another a double cheese mine goes, and obviously the guys had learned exactly how to do it because the wheel, the front wheel, would hit the one mine, and the double cheese would go under the buck of the buffalo or whatever, and it would, the double cheese mine does some serious damage. But anyway, we then pick up this mine and we're under the command of an engineer lieutenant we get this thing back into base now he's he wants to be all clever with this thing and he now wants to dismantle this mine to show us how this thing works against every rule against every standard order anyway he takes off the one cap and he look takes the cap off and the thing's been boosted now there's extra little tnt blockies inside this mine on top of the normal charge and he starts unscrewing the second cap and a little, thank God, a little voice inside him says, no, stop, 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 stop. And the mine's actually very simple. It's a box with a lid and the little pennies in the side is what determines the weight and when it breaks. So he takes the pennies out and he lifts the lid and they put it, uh, they put a uh, pull mechanism on that second dust cap onto a pull detonator. <laughs> so thank God he stopped because that would have been 30, 30 or 40 troops gone with a mine inside the base <laughs> but yeah so that that was infantry school after infantry school go to Wolfers bay because i think i pissed off the two ico infantry school because i didn't want to go to oshivello hex so he sent me to Wolfers bay Wolfers bay i then spent the rest of my rest of my two years at swa space at uh otavi and yeah so after after that, I went into the into university, and I get a phone call the one day. I actually asked a cousin of mine. He was a he was a major or commandant at that stage in the in the logistics. If he could find out where I was, so he goes in and he says, "No, you're part of Joburg Regiment, Johannesburg Regiment." Off I go to Joburg Regiment. Off parade, put my uniform on. Guys, here I am. This is me. What's happening? And they couldn't find my file. You walk into this room. And there's just thousands of files piled up in boxes and on the floor. And it completes it. I walk out there after two hours. I go, okay, I'll just leave this alone. And a couple of months later, I get a phone call from the Transvaal Scottish. This is such and such and such and such from the Transvaal Scottish. Lieutenant, yes, I'm Lieutenant so-and-so. No, sir, please come report on Tuesday night. So I go, I've got no interest in playing in a band. I played in, I played in a pipe band when I was at school. I was a drummer in a pipe band at CBC Pretoria. I played the tenor drums. No, no, sir, no, sir, no, sir. This is your army unit. This is where you're going to do your camps. And, and, and the Transvaal Scottish is, yes, yeah, sir. No, please come in Tuesday night. Off I go. And they had a headquarters down bottom end of Dürrenfontein, somewhere near the um, uh, the, the Oriental Plaza. It was down there somewhere. Subsequently being demolished. I walk in there and he has all these oaks in kilts and fancy uniforms. And I'm in my browns and green beret. Interview with the two I see. He says, right, this is your unit, man. Here, go get uniform. And I go to the stores and there's this. And it and obviously Transvaal Scottish, I mean, it's a, a lot of it caught a lot of guys of English descent and old Scots when there was a guy there, he was the storeman. I, I think he was a warrant officer, a guy by the name of Vic Anslow. But he had a mustache. That's the biggest mustache I've ever seen in my life. He was a real, real, real good, solid soldier. I mean, a row of medal ribbons, World War II medal ribbons and and he was the stores guy. Very parat. Yes, sir. Did I walk out of there with a pile of uniform that I didn't know what to do with? And, I, and for the next two to three weeks, I would come in on Tuesday night because the admin, admin nights of the citizen force was Tuesday nights. You'd come in and do the admin and prep for camps and training and whatever else was happening. And I'd sort of make mental notes and I'd write down little notes of what uniform went with what piece of kit there because the RSM at that stage was a riller. Guy that had money from Staden. <laughs> and you didn't want to get as a second lieutenant, you didn't want to get on the wrong side of the RSM. And uh yeah, and then from from there we we I sort of found a home in the Transvaal Scottish. Awesome unit, one of our old traditional units formed in 1902 after the Anglo-Boer War. Scottish volunteers formed a peacekeeping force in Johannesburg, and it was formed by a guy by the name of the Marquis of Talibardine. Now a Marquis is the son of a duke. And the duke, being a duke, is the highest of the titles that you can have in the English hierarchy. So we're talking serious guys. So the duke, the duke of Athol, 
is I think the most senior peerage in the British system. So should, for example, should Charles not have had any children, the Duke of Athol would almost be second or third in line to take over from Charles. Now, obviously, Charles had kids and they've got kids and kids and kids. So that now moves away. But it's a very, very senior, senior title. So the Duke of Athol's son formed the Transvaal Scottish. And that sort of, well, it was, it was the Scottish horse and then it became the Transvaal Scottish later. So we go back to 1902. We're not quite the oldest traditional unit in South Africa. That honour belongs to one of the regiments down in KZN in Durban. And there was one or two in Cape Town that beat us as well. But we one of the oldest, were one of the oldest regiments in, in, the, in the South African army. And that's where I did my camps. I've I qualified. I've just qualified for my thirty year medal. Uh, so I've got my I've got my John Chard and my John Chard decoration. I'm waiting for my thirty years. So it's, it's it's about seven years late, but my thirty year medal is somewhere, somewhere in the pipeline. But the camps that I did, I you know when I started my camps after university, we just pulled out of Angola, and I I did most of my camps up northern border. So every single kilometer from where the Kruger Park intersects with um, Zimbabwe through Bight Bridge, past Thule Block, all the way down to Groblesbrug. I've been in command of that part of the border at some part of my career as company commander. I've been acting battalion commander. I've been 2IC. I've been uh, all, all sorts of stuff. And I've walked every single kilometer of that, of that entire border. So <laughs> that's, that's sort of the military service he did. But the Transvaal Scottish being a traditional unit was a very much a parade orientated. It's a showpiece. It's serious. It's a serious showpiece. I mean, it's a, a spectacular sight. You've got a whole platoon or company in kilts. I mean, our band, our band is South African champion band. They regularly get invited to go play at the Edinburgh Tattoo. They've just come back from the Basel Tattoo. They compete in all the competitions. They won the South African championships this last year again. And a pipe band, a pipe band just works. A pipe band is just great. And the Toronto the Tron Scottish Pipe Band is an awesome bunch of guys. I don't know how they play the bagpipes. So there's been way too many parties in the pub with these guys, but they are fan it's a fantastic organization. And I, we, you know, for 30 years, that was almost my second home. Every Tuesday night, you'd go in camps, one month, two month, three month camps. We would go and do border duty parades all over the place, especially sort of sort of November, December, November with Armistice Day and all of those, you know, freedom of the city of Johannesburg, freedom of Barberton. Those were all parades that we did. And one of the highlights was um, because of our affiliation with the with the Athol Highlanders, the, the Duke of Athol. The Duke of Athol holds the distinction of being the only person in Europe who's allowed to have a private army. Queen Anne gave it to him in 1600 and something or other. So the Duke of Athol has the right to a private army. Obviously, the Queen at that stage was short of army, so, he, so she said, okay, Mr. Duke, have an army. Please raise an army for me and come help me fight the Spanish. But he's kept, he's kept that privilege. And we were invited in 1995 to go across to Scotland and participate in the 100th anniversary of the Athol Highlanders receiving their colours from Queen Victoria. So, 95, everybody loves South Africa. We were the first unit allowed into Europe in full uniform um, to go and visit. So, we put, we went through France. We went through Delville Wood. We went through the First World War battlefields, where, which is on our battle battle honours now as well. I actually was parade commander at a, at a parade we held at Delville Wood, one of the, one of the big fights we had in, in France. That was actually a funny one. We had a we had a lovely old padre, padre Marshall, also one of these old British British guys. He's a he's he was the kind of guy who volunteered, I think, at fourteen or fifteen to go fight in World War Two. He hit his age. He lied about his age to go fight, and he wound up as our as our regimental padre. Lovely old man, and this was his chance. Now you're standing on parade. I'm in the front, and now you've got the it's full sword drill, full claymore drill. And now you're standing with sword reverse. So your arm is now back to front, upside down. And this was the Padre's chance. And he went on and he went on and he went on. And he this was his gap to now. Delville Wood, one of his... This, and my arm went to sleep. And at the end of the parade, I couldn't pick my sword up. 
and I could see my colonel, the two, the two colonels of the 1st Battalion, the 2nd Battalion, sitting in front and they're panicking. So I'm picking my sword up. I had to have my second, I had to take my left hand and, and stabilize it till I got blood flow back. And then I could hold my sword again and carry on at the parade. But yeah, so, and then we went to the UK. And part of that was we managed to, we were invited to visit the Queen Mother. And it, was, it wasn't Buckingham Palace, it was Clarence House, which is where the Queen Mother lives. But uh, again, one of the highlights, I mean, you're in full kit, all the uniforms, the badges, the buttons, the swords, the whole, the whole Gedunte is, is all polished and shiny. And we stayed down in a, in a place called Chelsea. We stayed in Chelsea Barracks with the pensioners. I know the guys in the, like the guy who won the British Got Talents, the, the Chelsea pensioners. We're right next door to them in one of the barracks there. But as you leave, you check all the oaks on the corner of the road, talking to the collars, blah, 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 as you're driving now out of the barracks. And obviously, it's the MI5, whoever it is, SAS. Who knows who these oaks were checking the security? Get to the back of the palace and I can see a carriage comes in and some ambassador or someone with a big tricorn hat and feathers and stuff everywhere comes in. He's in front of us. He goes and he comes back. Then we, we're allowed in. And such a lovely lady. Gave us all a little bit of time, and I mean, I and I, I, I fondly remember we chatted about the rugby and about the French and uh, about about the Australians. We were about to play Australia in the opening match of the of the World Cup. I think it was ninety five, and I had a chat with her about the rugby. It's a lovely, lovely lady, and uh, there were you were allowed two drinks. It's ten o'clock in the morning. You offered two drinks. You're allowed a gin and tonic and a whiskey water. That's it. Cupella. End of story. No water. No coke. No nothing. Gin and tonic or whiskey. So, yeah, so the Transvaal Scottish, what can I say? I mean, it's a very, very prestigious unit. We Maybe the guy still recognizes the, the big red feather that we had. You can actually see here in the background on my on my screen here, I've got the in the, the little shields in my library, got the, the, red, the red hackle given to us by the Black Watch in the UK. When we fought next to them in World War I, they decided we were worthy of wearing their, their red hackle, so we tied to the Black Watch in the UK. So, interesting times and a lot of fun in the Transvaal Scottish. Um, sadly, it's sort of come to an end. Most of the traditional units now have changed names and are, and, and are, are going. They're not all of them. Not all of them are completely dead yet, but most of them are sort of given up and shut down. We still got our big museum in Johannesburg. We got our pub and our mess and our museum. It's one of the best regimental museums in the country in Parkdown in the old house of Thomas Cullinan. The guy owned the Cullen and Diamond Mine. And I was thinking about it, you know, coming on to this, and thanks for the invite to come chat on this on this forum. And at school, I always hated history, but my business is being a, a tour guide. I run a safari tour and safari company, so I host international visitors that come into South Africa, and they know nothing about our history. They've got no, they vaguely know where they are in Africa, if they're lucky, but they know nothing about the history. They know nothing about where we've come from and all the rest of it. So almost by force, I had to learn our history. And history for me has become almost like a puzzle. And it's a never ending 20,000 piece puzzle. And you've got the picture that there's essential pieces missing. And every time you go into a museum or you pick up a book or you talk to someone, you go, wow, I didn't know that about this fight or incident or treaty or happening or conference or something. And you go, that explains why this happened. And that explains, now I understand why this guy did this at that time. And South Africa has got the most incredible unbelievable, varied, and rich history. And when you start talking to the international clients and tourists about our history, they actually go back and they sit back in awe if you're telling a good story and they go, wow, we don't have that kind of history. Because South African are blessed with all these cultures, all these influences, all these immigrants, all these indigenous people, all the influences of everything, and all of that 
somehow bashed heads at some point in South Africa. And there's a lot of history we don't know. There's a lot of history we don't understand. There's a lot of history that we are still uncovering. The pre-European history is very, very vague in South Africa. And it's always interesting to try and put the stuff together. Now, being a tour guide, you take instructions. Sometimes you have your own groups that you look after. Sometimes you take instructions from an operator who says, here's 20 people, here's the itinerary, do this route. And invariably, you're driving through some dorpy somewhere or you're going through some little town somewhere. And some oak is there in church square. There's always a church square intersecting with the Fortrecker Road. And in the middle of that is the Engia Kerk. And I've got a wonderful theory. I still got to test this whole story. The smaller the dorpy, the bigger the Kerk. The smaller the town, the bigger the church. But I mean, look, there's some masterpieces out there. You got sometimes you got to stand back at these churches and you look at some of the churches that Gerard Murdaik designed. I mean, he's the guy who did the Fortrecker Monument. Just, I mean, they they you just sit back and you just go, wow, this is a masterpiece. But there is no way any one person can know exactly what statue is there in that dorpy you've never been through and he has some kind of monument or guy on a horse or some oaky standing there going rah rah whatever it is and i then came up with the idea of making this mobile app called road trip it's it's and i it started when i went through colesburg now one of my pet hates on these trips and on these journeys and stuff is I call it RSAP's disease as soon as possible. You drive to Cape Town, you want to get into Cape Town as fast as you can, but you miss so much on the road. All the little dorpies, the little shops, the lack of little restaurants, and the in the, the national highways have bypassed all of these places and you stop at a garage and you buy some plastic hamburger somewhere and then off you go again and you're missing out on all these little towns. So I always try and go through these little, through these little dorpies. And I was going through Colesburg and you come off the off the N1 and you go into town and you pass in some old shops and some broken down garage and you get into the main part of town. And then you come up to the church and the road splits around the church. There's a circle around the church. But right there is a really funny, strange little, like it almost looks like something out of a florist shop, if that makes sense, like a, like a, like a, like a steel contraption. So I stopped. My wife says, what are you doing? I said, I want to see what this thing is. Why? I said, no. It looks strange. I want to see what it is. And it was a monument raised. The money was raised for this monument by the inhabitants of Colesburg to celebrate Queen Victoria's Silver Jubilee. And they put up this little thing in the middle of town. And I go, wow. That's, that's just kind of interesting to me. And thousands of people drive past that thing and thousands of people miss that, miss that kind of history that Colesburg, in the middle of the Karoo, had enough love for Queen Victoria that they could raise enough money to raise a statue for her centenary. So I thought, you know what, this is interesting stuff. So I took a picture of two of it and I got one or two other mobile apps that are running. And I thought, you know what, let's see what we can do with this. Through the Transvaal Scottish, strange enough, I met up with a guy who tried to come into the unit as part of like a university officers training system that they that they tried for a little while. They were trying to get quality graduates into the military to come in as second lieutenants to try and build up the officer corps for a while. And I met a guy by the name of Emil Kutsia, who's not currently busy with his PhD in history. And him and I just just got on, just we just got on. And I got to know that his hobby was traveling towns and taking photographs of monuments and statues and museums. And I said to him, listen, you've got this whole wealth of info. Let's see if we can't do something with it. And it took a bit of convincing, but eventually saw that this had a lot of possibility. So what we've done is we've translated his entire hobby of monuments, statues, memorials, graves, whatever you can think of. And we've now put this all on a mobile app. 
So the mobile app now has got 3,200 and something, I think, listings on it in total. And every everyone's got a photograph of the statue monument memorial. It's got a brief historical description of what of what there is. I mean, if you really want the history, go and buy a book. Or go onto Wikipedia or go and buy the history of South Africa in 5,000 pages by someone. This is purely a this is Andres Pretorius. He was the oak that fought at Blood River and he rode his horse from KZN to Pretoria to now come sign the treaty or whatever. Okay, like and now I know why Pretorius is sitting on his horse here in, in wherever the, what whatever little dopey this thing is. So and it's and it's really taking off. And um an interesting part of this, and I think maybe that's why I, I'm sort of on your show, because South Africa's got an incredible military history. And it's got a military history that very, very few nations can actually beat. And I mean, just just some some fun facts. When when Jan van Riebeek arrived, he had a a private mercenary army with him. Remember, van Riebeek arrived as the VOC, the Dutch East India Company. Nothing to do with colonies. Nothing to do with government. This was this was money. It was cheaper for the VOC to start Cape Town than it was to lose all the ships. They made more money by paying Jan to sit in Cape Town and start the little harbour than to not have it so that he could resupply the ships properly. More ships came up and down and returned back to Holland. And in fact, in English, an interesting one is when you have that saying, my ships come in. I don't know if you know that saying, my ships come in. It comes from those days because those ships would be funded by private investment. You take a chance. You take your... 100 pounds or guilders or whatever it was in that stage, and you take a gap and you'd say, I will put 100 pounds down on the ship. Because if it comes back, I'm going to make 1,000 pounds. But only one in three ships or one in four ships made it back in those days. So you were, you were gambling. And when your ship came in, it was a saying that I've now made my money. And it comes from the days of the VOC and the British traders and the Jan van Riebeek, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. But he had a bunch of Hungarian mercenaries with him. Hungarian mercenaries were the security contingent in Cape Town. And these were these were guys that were kicked out of Hungary and they couldn't find a home in Germany because of this and religion and politics and what, what, what. And eventually they wound up in Holland. Holland was the catch net of every refugee at that stage in Europe because Holland has always been super tolerant. So they get all the scrub now from all over the place would come into Holland. You know, so it goes right back to those days. Then you look at you look at our Zulu history, you look at Isan Juana, you're looking at Rourke's Drift, you're looking at the biggest defeat Britain ever had anywhere in their colonies at Isan Juana. They got clapped. They got clapped silly in Isan Juana. And that's by the Zulus. So we got a massive Zulu military tradition. Then we got the fur trekkers and the Zulus fighting each other. In, in KZN. Then you've got the British in the Fortrex. The British had to kick the Fortrex out of, out of KZN. You're looking at the first Anglo Boer War, the second Anglo Boer War. Second Anglo Boer War, the tactics we developed in the second Anglo Boer War resonated over the whole world. We instigated brand new systems, trenches, trenches at Machafontein. The British had never seen trench warfare in their life before. They got clapped at Machafontein because the Burgis were clever enough to dig trenches. The first time artillery was used to fire over infantry was on Long Tom Pass. They'd never done it before. So, you know, we've got this unbelievable, especially military history, never mind the other interesting stuff that we've got. But, so the road trip app started with this, and as we slowly started adding all these spots, all the battlefields and the monuments and memorials and guys on horses and ox wagons and all this kind of stuff. Now, if I can do a bit of a screen share here. I hope you're seeing that. So the, the app's called the Road Trip app. And you can see the little Road Trip logo there because I've teamed up with a magazine called the Road Trip uh, magazine as well. So we share a bit of info and we do a little bit of um, combined marketing and stuff. So they they really like like what I'm doing. And that's what that's what the app logo actually looks like. So you can download this app off Google. You can download it off Apple. You can get get the links off off the the road trip website. But when you when you 
get to the first screen. That's what the screen looks like. So you got kilometers. So your default screen will ask you where you where you are, and it gives you everything that we found within ten kilometers of of where you are. Or you can choose fifty kilometers. You can choose a hundred k's. You can choose the map country. Some phones can't handle map country. There's just too much info on it. If you've got a nice new phone with decent memory, you can do the whole country. But Map International is another good one. We've got um, spots where South Africans, we've got like the Boer War internment camps in Ceylon. We've got the Korean Air Force Memorial because our boykies fought in the Korean War. There's Boer War memorials in Australia. There's a whole lot of stuff in the UK. Um, General Ben Fulun is, is buried in the US in in um, Arizona. I think he's there buried in Arizona somewhere. Ben Fulun who had his guns in the Kruger Park. He's buried in the USA. We got his grave on the app. You know, so there's a whole lot of these little interesting things in there. But what we've done with it is we've actually divided this app up into, into all these categories so that you can actually search for stuff that you're interested in. So you can see the first Anglo-Boer War, second Anglo-Boer War, Afrikaans language monuments. That's one of my favorite ones, Afri Afrikaans language monuments. We are so proud of our Afrikaans language. We've got 13 monuments just to Afrikaans. No other country in the world has got monuments to their language. Not one. We, we've we got Afrikaans that's so special. And most people know the one in Pal, the, the big Tal monument that was unveiled in 76 for the um, anniversary of Afrikaans being recognized as an official language. But you've got 13 language monuments. Anglo-Zulu War, the Great Trek. The Great Trek is a fantastic story. If you if you really go into what these guys did, the Foot Tracker Monument's having a big revamp at the moment. We seem to be tying up something with the Foot Tracker Monument. Um, I mean, the story that the Foot Trackers or the story of those Foot Trackers is, is amazing. And then something that a lot of people don't recognize is we've got the anniversaries of the Great Trek. The 1938 and the 19, 1988 Great Trek. And you go through little dorpies and towns and we don't have them all. I found another one or two today that we don't even have on the app yet. In that these ox wagons, replica ox wagons, went across the country, and when they got into a little dorpy, they went over wet concrete. And now the wagon tracks and the ox hoof prints are on those concrete slabs, and they're normally outside the church or outside the, the city hall. And a lot of them, believe it or not, have even got um, a little box buried in there that is going to be taken out in 2038 with some kind of gadgets and thingies inside it, and then people have forgotten what these things are. So like I said, I mean, we've, we found, what do we, we found 114 of them so far. And I they guarantee there's another 20, 30 that we don't have yet. Little dorpies in town that we just haven't gone through. International Kruger Park, our national parks are, are, are incredible. We've got the world-class national parks here. I've done, I've done the Kruger Park. Kruger Park is my, is my, is my favorite spot. I've done the entire Kruger Park. With all the camps, all the roads, all the maps, all the picnic sites, everything is in like on the Kruger Park. We still got to get to the other parks. Museums. Do you know we've got 362 museums you can visit? There's not just the big ones in Pretoria. Little town, town, little towns have got museums and they've got little hidden hidden holes, little private museums of the Anglo Boer War stuff. Um in Bloemfontein. The Anglo Boer War Museum in Bloemfontein is a mind-blowing museum. The the Ditsong National Museum of Military History in Sachsenwald in Johannesburg. That's a world-class museum when you go there. It is absolutely world-class. And it is worth spending a day just to go into, into, that, into that museum. National parks, religious points of interest. The, I mean, we've got 180 what we consider to be the nicest and best and fanciest churches that we found, as well as Hindu temples and we got all we got a richness there of 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 religions and stuff. Roadside handcraft that one took a bit of a bit of a hammering during during lockdown, so we need a reserve. Shipwrecks we've got the twenty most most interesting shipwrecks, mysteries, ghost stories, and airplanes that have disappeared. A lovely story: the Springbok was an airplane that um, I think went into East London. And flew out over the over the ocean and just disappeared. Poof, gone like 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 Bermuda Triangle stuff. They discovered it last week. They found the wreckage last week from 1960 something. They they were diving and they found the wreckage of the Springbok. Fantastic story there as well. 
Victoria Cross Awards. We've got a whole lot of South Africans that have won Victoria Crosses. So we've got what we think is every South African who's won a Victoria Cross. We've actually got on the app as well. Things to do, things to see. Things to see is a category that is just some stuff that we can't actually put into another box. It's a memorial, it's a plaque, it's a statue, it's a oak on a horse, it's a what, whatever we can find there. Then we're coming to some interesting ones down the bottom here. And we, I think we get onto the border war just now, but town histories, lighthouses, liberation, liberation struggle sites is, is quite one that, that's starting up now as well. Graves of notable South Africans, sportsmen, ex-prime ministers, um, state presidents, all that, all that kind of stuff. But what has happened with this app is we've got these categories. That's the map I get on my PC. That's what you can get on your on your phone as well. Every single dot on there is one of these points of interest that falls under one of these categories. And I chose one. That is possibly quite interesting. That's what you can get like in and around Joburg. That blue spot in the middle, that main place next to Midrand, that's your location. So it takes everything around your location and it says that's what you've got to see around you. You can click on the bottom categories. You can go to the top hamburger and go map national. So you can choose which way you want to go with this thing. But then when you choose a spot, I just I had a look at this one. It's out towards the out on the West Rand in Randfontein. There's a war memorial in Randfontein, and it's one of the more interesting ones. So when you tap on that location, you see the heading down the bottom here with what with what this thing is. If you tap that, you get the whole story. That's a nice little example of what you can get when you when you look on the app. Now the war memorial in Randfontein is an interesting one. Because it includes World War One, it includes World War Two, and it includes the border war. The border war is one of these wars that is sort of shoved in the background, and people don't want to talk about it. It's maybe too new, too raw, too political. I don't know, give it give it a name, but it's one of the very very few memorials in South Africa that actually commemorates the border war. And that's one that makes it very interesting to me. And through through this thing, obviously, you know, because of my service in the Transvaal Scottish, I'm still a member of a lot of veterans associations and 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 I started then I started chatting, and I've got a particular interest in the Anglo Boer War because it was such a, a different it was a different war. It was a really, really different war. It was a brand new war to the first modern war that the British had fought. For the first time, they weren't fighting against Oaks, throwing spears at them, Oaks armed with, with, with modern rifles. So it was a whole new system of warfare for the British. And I then got to meet a guy who wrote a book called The Anglo-Boer War Blockhouses. Now, I think a lot of people know what the blockhouses were. You can go, if you drive out of, out of Johannesburg and you go south, there's one just other side of... Um, as you're coming into Funabel Park, three in the area, there's one there at that garage. There's two or three up in Krugersdorp around Krugersdorp um, city center. There's um, a couple up in the Machalisburg. The Machalisburg was was quite a, a centerpiece for a lot of the fights in the Anglo Boer Walks. The Boers could hide lacquer in the cliffs and stuff next to Pretoria. Yeah. So I got to meet this guy. And one thing that I've learned and come to realize by doing this app i'm pretty good with my history but the scale the scale of some of this this stuff is something that you just don't realize these blockhouses were eventually built because the british didn't have an answer to our mobile warfare burrs on horses mobile across the felt and you have you got this Victorian British army tied to railway lines and roads and a mood of a logistic system, slow moving. And these guys couldn't really survive longer than maybe two or three days away from their main supply lines. And the Boers were running, running circles around these guys and clapping the wagon trains and clapping the supply lines, blowing up the railway lines, etc. Then the British come up with this idea. They're going to now put these blockhouses down. 
So they build things like that, like as an example on the front of this, on the on the cover of this book. Each one of these has got 10 to 12 guys in it. And these guys are now stationed in there. But a couple of hundred yards away is another one. So they can see each other. And then a nochayim, and another one, and another one, and another one. And I spoke to Simon Green about it. I mean, you know, I find it a fascinating system. And we've got about 60, 65 of these blockhouses that are worth going to visit on the app. And a lot of them are hidden. They're on private land. They're around the corner. They're down a little dirt road somewhere. So you're not likely to, to see them. The only one that you're really going to see, there's one just north of Lanesburg on the N2. That's right on the road. And that's a good one to go and visit. So it gives you an idea. It's a beautiful idea and a beautiful example of what these blockhouses are. But you've got 10 to 12 oaks in here. And they're still discovering more blockhouses. But... Simon, on record, I think has got 9,300 blockhouses that he's found on maps, old records, British survey charts, British engineering maps from the Anglo Boer War. 9,300 blockhouses, all of them with 10 to 12 guys in them. That's 100,000 men are tied up in blockhouses. The scale of this thing is unbelievable. The supplies and the food and water and ammo and clothing for a hundred thousand men who spent two years in these blockhouses. And that's Oaks tied down. That's not your fighting force. And I went to Simon and I said, wow, why don't I translate your book into electronic? And he went, wow, I've been looking at doing that. And I said to him, well, it's very simple. If you do that, it's going to cost you 150,000 Rand before you've built a mobile app. Let me put your stuff onto Road Trip. You promote me. I promote you. I'm getting a valuable resource, plus the fact that I just enjoy the history and, and learning about this stuff. And we went, fantastic. So I've got the black, the Anglo Boer War blockhouses on my app. So you want to find a blockhouse in South Africa that, that, that's there? My map will give it to you. The app navigates you right to the front door of this blockhouse in the middle of the millies on some Oaks farm there in the Free State. Then I got chatting to another very interesting character, a guy by the name of Dean Allen, who is a professor of history down in the Eastern Cape. And he's written two fascinating books on the Eastern Cape. Now, the Eastern Cape also has an amazing history Right from the Klausas arriving because they were under pressure from Shaka Zulu, they moved down off of, out of out of the out of the eastern parts of Southern Africa. They hit head on against the expansion of the VOC and the Cape Colony. You got a hundred years of war in that area of the Eastern Cape. A hundred years. All sorts of border conflicts, Klausas versus Boers or versus Dutch to start, then against farmers. You got the 1820 settlers that came in. We've got old fortified towns, towns that were built around forts in the Eastern Cape. All of this history is now in, in, in this book, in, in his volume one and his volume two. And I literally I finished volume two of, 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 of Dean's book today. And there's another 150 or 180 spots or something that I added just from his two books. And it's the military history. It's the sites you can see. It's the forts you can visit. It's, you know, the statues and the beautiful churches and the 1820 settler stuff. And it's just amazing. You look at the architecture. The houses are almost built like little forts in that area because of those constant incursions from the Klausas and the wars, and that, and that whole thing, that's where the Great Trek started. The Great Trek started out of the Eastern Cape and that constant conflict, and the Great Trek moved north, and the Great Trek is one of the reasons we've got the history we've got today. The foot trekkers came through, and if there's two people, everybody blames us, the foot trekkers, and it's Jan van Riebeek. So, you know, that uh, that entire area is where Gerrit Maritz came from. It's where um, Peter Tief came from. They came from that Eastern Cape area, and the, and the Great Trek started. But then I think for most of the, the listeners to this channel, I think probably the most interesting one is a book by a gentleman by the name of Marius Skippers. Now, Marius Skippers is an X32 Battalion member, and I think he's been on the channel before. And he approached me and he said, do you want to do the border war? I said, I'd, I'd love to do the border war. 
because it's a topic that most people don't want to tackle. It's a little bit politically, I don't know, hot potato-ish. I don't know, give it, give it a name. But nobody really wants to talk about it. Nobody really wants to have the history of it. And a lot of the guys who are veterans of that era, I don't even think understand the scale of what happened up there. I was there. I was part of that jewel. I was I was up up I was in the border. I didn't realize how big the scale was of this fight and of the combined fights that we had up there. And you look at the propaganda that's spouted about it and about Quito Quanaval and it was this great communist do me a favor, don't even start. I mean I've I've had to I've been to a couple of these um things like at the at the, at the National um Military History Museum and you and I was standing there with a mate of mine who served in three two and at at the museum they've actually got a three two hall at the in in the museum in Saxonwald. And some oak was hunting on about how the Cubans clapped us and they shot us out the sky and they killed all these vehicles. And I stopped this guy and I said, Excuse me, were you actually there? He says, No, no. I said, You're talking complete cuck. You're talking complete cuck. I think the, in the entire border war, I think we lost five vehicles. I think five vehicles were captured, I think, in total in the, in the entire border war, through all the fights we had. And I go, we destroyed brigades of oaks at Quito Quanaval. Oh, but, 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 I said, just, just, just stop. You know, and unfortunately, that story has gained momentum because it's the popular story that the South Africans were beaten at Quito Quanaval. And I think that's also why a lot of people shy away from the border war story. But we've got a border war icon on our, on our app. And it took a little bit of thinking, and I eventually thought, you know what, the rattle has got to be probably the best icon for that um, particular category. We were thinking boss hoot, and we were thinking pro patria medal, and, we were, and eventually I thought, you know what, the rattle, because the rattle did 99% of the fighting of the cross-border stuff, not really the Southwest African stuff. But the cross-border stuff was 90% rattles. And, I mean, when you look at the outline of that thing, that's the fighting vehicle. The Biffle, the Biffle's not the fighting vehicle. The Biffle's the transport. The rattle is the fighting vehicle. So we chose we chose the rattle for that, for that category. And Marius has written a fantastic book, and it's called, it's called Move the Border. And he, in, in that book, he's actually got... All major, all the major fights that we had in Angola, as well as this, this, the, the, the very, very first one at Ongumbulashi, when the SAP were, the, were still um, handling handling the border incursions, and they clapped that first Swapa base that was in that was in um, Southwest Africa. But we've got a total now of fifty four border war sites on the app. One thing we do on this app is it's not political. It's a straight happening. This happened here. We've got liberation sites on, on here as well. Five people were shot by the SOP here because they were part of MK or whatever. This is what happened here. No commentary, no nothing. And we've done exactly the same with the border war. So when you go into the category on the border war, Marius has supplied a certain number of photographs from that area because, as we all know, no one officially was allowed to take any photographs. But uh, we've got some photographs. But the nice part about what he gave me is there's a lot of the ops maps are in there as well. He's done fantastic descriptions of these battles. Um, here you can see the kind of the kind of listings that we've got here. And... Um, I chose this one, Mavinga. Mavinga is the better name for Quito Quanaval because Quito Quanaval was a shitty little village and the battle was actually a, actually for the battle for Mavinga rather than Quito Quanaval. But that's the kind of 
um, info that we've that we've got on here. There's an entire paragraphs and paragraphs of actual descriptions of why, what happened, the strategies, why it was important, what the SADF was trying to do, what FAPLA was trying to do, et cetera, et cetera. We're, we're trying to sort out. That was just an example of the troop movements, battle plans, kind of stuff. And it's it's and the entire idea behind the mm. app is purely to whet your appetite. If you want the heavy info, buy the book. We are not a dictionary, we are not an encyclopedia. Our our info is perfectly accurate. This is written by one of the guys who's there. Marius is one of the recognized. I think experts on the battles of the of the Angolan War or the Border War, the Bush War. You know, it's like my professor of history wrote all the historical posts on the app. You cannot fault our history. I've yet to find one person who questions our history, except I've had a couple of people denying that Blood River ever happened. So <laughs> they say it didn't happen. The story as we tell it on Blood River was nonsense. I mean, they, they just shut them down. But the, from the historical side, our history is 100% accurate. But what I so enjoyed about doing Marius's book here was if you have a look at this map, those are our fights in Angola. And it stretches from the coast to the border with the Congo. And I think it was Protea. It was either Protea or Savannah. I forget which one it was. We did... That battle group did 3,300 kilometers in, I think, 90 days. Now, to achieve that, I don't think there's another modern army that can do that. To keep the logistics and the supplies running for an entire battle group over three, and you know, let's call it three and a half thousand kilometers in the space of 90 days, the amount of expertise and the amount of knowledge and skill that was involved in that was unbelievable. So we've got the three books now on the app. I'm hoping to get some more books on, on historical topics on the app as well, because for authors, it's an easy way to make their publications electronic they cannot do this it would again to you know the, and, and no one's going to download i personally don't think someone's going to download just an app on the angolan border war or just an app on block houses or just an, it takes up too much space and you're never going to look at it whereas if it's thrown into a general mix of stuff you can go find it you can look at it you can just go and enjoy it and what we and honestly what i'm trying to do with this app and this this app is never going to be finished there's always going to be spots we don't have. There's always going to be a new monument, a new grave, a new memorial, a new something that's interesting is going to pop out of somewhere and a new little icy that's become a national monument that is of interest. So it's a never-ending work. But, I mean, we've got 3,200 and some spots on the app already. We're hoping to make it sort of almost like a, a tourist Bible for people coming into South Africa we're hoping that South Africans actually grab it. It costs like a whole 70 bucks or something to download it, and then you've got it. It's a very simple version of the app to start. We used a very basic platform. So it's got navigation on it. It's got the spots on it. It's got the history on it. We're looking at putting it onto a second platform where you can actually bookmark a spot. You can find a spot. You can make up a list of, I want to go see the spot. Um and with some fancy coding, we can probably make up a routing for you that it goes from here to here to here to here to here to here. That we don't have yet. Because I don't know how to do it. And we haven't, we haven't quite got there with that one. So I think to go back to the start of our conversation, you know, I think it was kind of a a bit of bit of karma that I wound up in like a kind of historical unit. Oh because it wound up chasing me almost into this love of history and museums and this kind of stuff. And the two just, just, just worked out. You know, a lot of people ask me what I got out of the army and why do I, why did I love it so much? And, 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 and I think this, the standard answer with it is, you know, it's, it's the, 
It's the best, the best two years of my life that I don't want to do again. But when I did my camps, the very first camp I went on, I'd, I'd literally, I'd just finished varsity. Varsity ended. The unit had been called up for a two-month camp, northern border. And they were short of officers. And I said to my colonel, I've got nothing to do. I, I, I'm not going to varsity. So let me do two-month camp for you. He said, lack, I need a company commander. There I go. Full lieutenant company commander. Hundred and something oaks on the northern border. And it was bloody difficult. Youngster, I mean, I'm watching 24, 25 years old. But where else do you get given an entire base, a couple of million rands worth of equipment, a hundred and something kilometers of border to protect, and da gaat jy. And even at that stage, I mean, we had one incident. I was I was the the company right off on the on the western side. Some of the more experienced company commanders were down towards Messina. We get called in the one day, and there's a great panic now. They've got intelligence that this crowd of Okies is coming over the border and they know that they're carrying landmines and what, 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 what. So we must now be awake and we must now really get our troops sorted and everything else. So I look at this lot and I go, you know what? I don't need this in my life. I really don't need this guck in my area with my farmers. So I pulled all my troops out. And I mean, we still laugh about it. Myself and my, my two I see at that stage are still big mates. We even used the water tanker to, to bus our troops. We put the troops into the water tanker to hide the fact that we were moving troops. So the water tanker went up and down the the the, the, the border, the border border road. And we brought all the troops and we concentrated them because I was based in what is now Mapungubu National Park, Vembi, Vembi Base. I don't know if you know Vembi Base. Lovely base. I mean, it's right on where the Shashi comes down onto the Limpopo. Lovely lookout on the rocks there, sunset. I mean, you drink a beer on the rocks, the baobab trees and all that are beautiful. Elephants are crossing the game reserve on the other side. So I pull all the troops in and I concentrate them like in the first 10 Ks. I literally, I had like a troop every couple of hundred meters. I just saturated it. I put all my vehicles there. I made a noise. I told them to let off an occasional illegal shot and make a fire and just cause chaos. Anyway, at work, because about two days later, a farm in my buddy's area got clapped. RPGs into the windows, AK-47s, the whole number. And eventually what happened, and, and the, nice, the nice thing on this, well, not the nice thing, but an interesting part on this thing, is because I, I did the assault pioneer training earlier, I was responsible for doing a lot of the landmine training Um when we were deploying and I I did quite extensive landmine training with the guys I set up whole ranges with booby traps and trip wires and I mean I learned how to make things go bang and pop and blow up and thunder flashes and I managed to blow up most of the battalion with 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 my booby traps but the guys came in as reaction into this farm and thank goodness they didn't drive in the Tuespur Paiki. They went through the gate and they went onto the grass to get to the, whether it was instinct, whether it was training, whether it was my little voice from three weeks or five weeks beforehand saying, the lieutenant said, I mustn't drive on a farm road when I go into, into, a, into a contact, whatever it was. But they went over the grass to go to, go to the farmhouse. And after we swept the road, they'd mined the road. So what happened is that they eventually backtracked and the tracks came down through Botswana or through Zim. They crossed the Shashi into Thule. And they were coming into my area. But obviously with the noise and all the nonsense I was doing, they turned around, went back over the Shashi and then came down into my mate's area and clapped the farm next door. But where I'm going with that is where at 20... Three, 24 years old, you get the management experience of a hundred and something guys, two months, you've signed for it, you're responsible for a couple of million bucks. End of camp, sign back, please. So I, I am ever grateful for the army and ever grateful for the 
management experience and the stories that we've got. And we've only scratched the surface of the stories that I've got from those years in the Transvaal Scottish. I must say to you, I'm, I'm very impressed as I'm sitting here because this is the type of app I would absolutely love. I mean, I love Easter. I loved it at school. I still love it now. But I want to ask you a question about the Transvaal Scottish. 1922, there was a minor strike going on in Joburg. Clombing yes. also. Yes. Probably then yes. communists yes. too. That was the first time actually that the South African Air Force bombed, let me say, anybody. No, they bombed they the bombed, first target uh, they, they bombed Johannesburg. Yeah, they bombed Benoni. Because the That's strike right. is the Transvaal Scottish were very involved in the strike. We've just gone through that 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 whole strike. And there were a couple of controversial issues with it. Again, allegations of people beating each other up and oh, rioters shot in the back. And then we lost a couple of the Transvaal Scottish guys. Um, I, I I speak under correction, but I think we lost one of our majors in one of those shootouts with the strikers. Maybe two majors, 10 guys, 12 guys, somewhere in that. In, in total, I think we lost 12 guys or something like that. And I actually had a lot of fun with it a little while ago. We've just gone through the anniversary, the centenary of the of the strike. And I added a couple of spots to the app on, on the 1922 strike. There was, for example, not directly involved with the Transvaal Scottish, but Ellis Park Stadium. When you drive down, you come out of Bramfontein, you take that sweeping dent bend and you go down the road into Ellis Park. On those fields there, one of the Joburg regiments was ambushed by strikers with a machine gun on that field. And there's a mural painted up on the wall. And when you look at that mural, you go, that's got to be 76 riots or something because it's the Okies with flames and dancing. It's a memorial to the 1922 strike right there at Ellis Park. In Fordsburg, the very, very last hideout of the strikers was in a public toilet in Fordsburg. I went and found that the other day. It still exists. There's a little blue plaque on the wall. The building looks exactly like it did in 1922. And I took some photographs and I located it and I put that up on the app. I spent I spent two or three days in Bramfontein Cemetery because the Transvaal Scottish, again, we got one of our old warrant officers who's like taken this as, as his project and he's got his whole file of all the graves of the guys in Bramfontein Cemetery. And I phoned him up and I asked him to come join me there. And there were one or two that we hadn't found before. We didn't know where they were. We knew they were in Bramfontein Cemetery. When you go into a cemetery like that, you're talking graves of 100 years ago. They've fallen over and it's been cracked or it's been broken or it's vandalized or it's not quite where the cemetery records say that it is, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And we keep very good care of those graves. We actually go in once or twice a year and we clean up and we make nice. You've got a nice memorial there to the Transvaal Scottish as you go down the main road. So those ones are all known. But then on one of the Facebook groups, I got hold of a bunch called Friends, Friends of it's either Friends of Bramfontein Cemetery or Friends of Johannesburg Cemeteries. And this is a crowd of volunteers that goes around cleaning up old cemeteries. And I posed a question on Facebook to these guys and I said, Look, let me come meet you at the at, at the at Bramfontein Cemetery. So like I arrived there, Warren, my sergeant major arrives. We say, How's it? I haven't seen each other for a couple of weeks, or whatever it is. This guy arrives in the cities, out comes the camping chairs, some soup or some, some tea, some sandwiches. We sit down, we have a long chat about all of this. And we went grave hunting and we located a grave of one of our guys who was shot in 1922 that we didn't know of. We knew he was there, but it was the first time we now found the location of his grave. And this stuff, I don't know, this, this just interests me. I mean, it's like if when you're driving in Johannesburg, and you drive past Wits University and you go down Jan Smuts Avenue and you're at that big intersection with that road that goes into Bromfontein. You, you're on Jan Smuts going into Bromfontein and it's that big road now that goes down um, towards the SABC. That traffic circle was an artillery, artillery site in this, during the strike. The Transvaal Horse Artillery that, 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 that sort of has got a link to the Transvaal Scottish as well, interesting, interestingly enough, 
because they, they trace their heritage back to our third battalion that got wiped out in World War II. But there were guns on Jan Smuts Avenue for the 1922 strike. And that stuff just interests me, that you drive past there every day and you, then you, you go back and you go, 1922, there were cannons here. Like you said, the South African Air Force bombed bombs in Benoni. Nuts. I mean, interesting stuff. There's the school, the school on the hill. I forget the name of the school. The bullet holes are still in the front of the school where the, the army was, was trying to get the strikers out of the school that barricaded themselves in the school. The bullet holes are across the, across the front wall of the school from the 1922 strike. We just want to say here that those, those miners were actually armed. I mean, many of them were First World War veterans. They had machine guns. Well, they, rifles. Absolutely. They were shooting back. Actually, I think we shot down one of the aircraft. No, those guys were seriously organized. But yeah, you're talking about war veterans here. And 1922, that come 1918, you're talking four years difference. There is no difference. These guys were army trained, military trained guys. So the 1922 strike was a, it was, it was a serious event. They weren't they weren't playing anymore. A lot of people died in the in the nineteen twenty two strikes. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, the Transvaal Scottish have, have played a big role in that one. And again, yeah, it's a kind it. of a, it's kind of a nasty one because it's sort of South Africans versus South Africans and sort of army against own civilians and stuff. And it it leaves a kind of a bad taste. But <laughs> but yeah, yeah, but you know, that's, that's history, isn't it? But I that's mean, that's what is good and bad. You have to experience both. Well, you that, know, that's you can't, exactly. You can't no, but that's exactly what we're trying to do with this app as well. We're just saying this is what happened here. This this place here, five Okies got shot. These Oaks shot these Okies, and it was because of X, Y, Z. And draw your own conclusions. I'm not interested in your politics on this thing. Um, but this is where South Africans were involved. This is the background and a bit of the history. And uh, we, that's what we're trying to showcase with this thing. No, this but, is yeah. fantastic. And just, just want... from, for, for the border war guys, I'm hoping that this gives you a bigger picture. Because, like I said, I mean, I've 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 been in for 30 years, and I did not realize the scale of what happened in Angola until I actually read and did this book. I hope so too. I mean, I this is fascinating. But I have some some question for you or, or an observation. Mm. In 1938. I think they started building the Wertrecker monument. And there was a mass marriage going on there. You had uh, hundreds of couples, I believe, who got married at the same day. It was like part of a festival. Yes. And yes. since then, you had quite a few aunties born with the name of Ephusia. It had to do with Ephusia. Ephusia. Yeah. I, I, I do remember my late mom actually had a late friend who was called Danny Ufusia. And then, of course, I went to university and I studied law, and then we realized something dreadful happened in 1958. And that was that none of those couples were actually legally married. <laughs> because the law clearly states that you must have something on top of your head, you must have like a roof. That's why you'll see people, even they get married in South Africa on, in the garden. It always under some yeah little little of roof. Or a, it's got or to a, be yeah, and you can only get married at certain times as well. I mean, like office hours, which had to do when you go to the magistrate and get married, you know, like that. So technically, all those children were out of wedlock. I just <laughs> want to say to these Sturo women, Tani's name, you know, you know, you know, you know. <laughs> but that's the lovely thing about history. It's just it's a small things behind it which you don't find in the history books. And there's nothing as great as standing at a place like Delville Wood and you imagine and see what happened at Delville Wood and the other battles, because every life is important. So no, this is fantastic. I, I really... I'm, you I'm, know, I, I've, I've got a couple of these these spots. Now, I understand. I mean, I've been, I've been lucky enough to be involved in tourism and I've traveled. I've, I've done coach tours and combi tours right across South Africa, through Namibia, Botswana. I've worked in Namibia, Botswana. I've gone up through Mozambique, Malawi, but and it's 90% of the 99% of the work is South Africa. So I've driven all over the place. And there's a couple of spots 
where your hair still stands up on end. Now, I've got a little podcast channel, the Road Trip podcast channel as well, where I go into a couple of these. And we've got, I think, 46, 47 episodes of Road Trip channel or Road Trip podcasts up on the channel as well. And some of them are really, really cool. I don't, I'm, I'm particularly proud of my one on, the, on, on Blood River. I love the story of Blood River. Then you stand, when you stand on that battlefield in Blood River and you stand in that circle of ox wagons and you know the story and you understand where these guys came from and the, the covenant that got read out nine times on the way through to Blood River. And eventually you can picture it. These guys are sitting there. It's misty. It's nighttime. The Zulus are there. The foot trekkers can hear the Zulus. And yet they're sitting inside this wagon, the ox wagon lager, and they're singing, and the lanterns are out. And you can picture this thing, man. And the next morning, this fight starts. And that's one of the battlefields where my hair still stands up. There's spooks on that battlefield. The other one where I get spooks is Isan Juana. I get big spooks on Isan Juana. You stand on that battlefield. And you try and picture the chaos that was happening. And like I said, this military history we've got, the British were outgeneraled. They were outthought. They were outmaneuvered. They were outfoxed. They were out everything that is San Juana. Those Zulu generals were geniuses. And the leadership on the battlefield at is San Juana, where I forget the guy's name, stood up. Because the British almost had that fight. They almost had it. They stopped that wave. They managed to stop that first wave of Zulu attack. And they had the Oaks in the Dongas. And the Zulus had stopped. And that one guy stood up and said, are you sons of sons of shark or are you women? What, is there something in that line? And the Zulus came at them again. And then the British were gone. That leadership, unbelievable. And you stand on that battlefield, and if you get a guy there who understands that whole fight properly and gives you the story, your hand, your hair stands up on end. I, you, I don't get that, like, for example, at Rogue's Drift. Rogue's Drift, another mood of a fight. But I don't get the spooks at Rogue's Drift. For whatever reason. Yeah, we wiped them completely out at this on Lana. I believe one of the frigates of the Navy is actually called after this on Lana. Yeah, uh, because no, of was... that battle, no, not one Brit actually survived. And, and again, it's one of my. I, I love, I love the the lesson it gives us, because Isantwana was always promoted as a British loss, not as a Zulu victory. And it's just that little twist around that you got to swap your thinking and go. It was a serious, brilliant. Zulu victory. Wasn't a British loss. The British buggered it up. They made a mess of this on Juana. Chelmsford, Chelmsford buggered it up completely. Battle, battle, battle drills that a second lieutenant learns. He he ignored at Isan Juana. And the Zulus clapped him. And, and but that place, your 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 hair stands, your hair stands up on in on Isan Juana. It's like my favorite mo monuments and museums. Mon museum, Anglo Boer War Museum in, in Bloemfontein. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant museum. You go to the Ditsong Military History Museum. Brilliant museum. Um, Bloemfontein's got a separate issue because you've got the Froa Monument there. And that is one of those places where you get quiet. When you see the concentration camps and you see the numbers and the names etc etc and I've, I've managed to visit a couple of the concentration camps and a couple of the concentration camp cemeteries and another place that that really hits me is a little town called springfontein springfontein is down on the n1 on the way down to cape town now it's dusty nothing springfontein it's called springfontein because it used to be a spring with water. The steam locos would come up. They'd just come up the escarpment. They were stopping Springfontein to hoi water to keep going. No more steam locos. Springfontein is dying. There's a lovely little lodge there that's got a fantastic blockhouse 
replica and a guy got a private museum in Springfontein as well. There's a concentration camp cemetery in Springfontein. But if you go through town, there's a second concentration camp cemetery in Springfontein. And it's the children. It's the unbaptized children that were buried separately to the main concentration camp. And you stand there in this little cemetery and there's these tiny little graves, man. And these are all kids of three, four, five weeks old, one month old. And they buried there. And that gets me. So yeah, this app yeah. of yours uh, uh, would, would actually show the concentration camps as well. Um, I do I do have most of the concentration camps on it. Um, I don't have them all yet. Okay, but um, again, with the app, what we're trying to do with it is we're trying to get the places that that you can actually see. So we're not trying to get places that is just five stones in the felt and there's nothing to see. We, you know, it's like the blockhouse, like Simon Green with his blockhouse book also says, he's put it on there if it's higher than knee high. Because then you've got something to see. You've got something physically there and it's not just an old ring of stones in the felt or something like that. You know, so yeah, we've got we've got the ones that, that we found out about. I think there were, wow, I think 30-something concentration camps in total. I'd speak under correction here. But we certainly don't have all of them, Marcus. Some of them are gone. Some of them have just disappeared and gone and back, and there's absolutely nothing left. But yeah, those concentration camps and those concentration camp graves is a whole different story. Another another lovely one that I found was in Belfast, as you're going out from Pumalanga side. I'd heard that there was a a trooper there, a troopy who'd won the Victoria Cross, is buried in the in the grave graveyard. In Belfast. Now, to try and find this graveyard, it took me about two hours of dri driving around Belfast to find this place. And eventually, I see this little flipped old little sign, like a cardboard thingy on a tree, grave. And I think, okay, here we go. Thank goodness I got a four by four. So we don't know down this donga. And you get into this graveyard. And the British side beautifully looked after. It's been raked. It's been cleaned, it's square, it's sorted. And next to it is the Boers side, and that's completely derelict. And I go, that is a project that someone needs to take on, is to look after the Boer side of the Anglo-Boer War graveyards. Because it's it's the guys who died, it's guys who fell in combat, it's it's victims of the concentration camps are in those are in those graveyards but no one's bothering to look after it and that's kind of a project that i think is something that 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 needs to get taken on i don't know who's going to take it on maybe anglo-american one of the big big companies needs to take it on or something i don't know but that would be a worthwhile project to actually try and preserve our heritage because it is going bits and pieces are going there's um, statues that get vandalized and the thing gets stolen, a, a head, a copper bust or something gets stolen. And I guarantee it's in the local scrapyard dealer. Guaranteed. The plaques are get, getting stolen or graves and things. So uh, what's going to happen with that? I don't know. But at least we're, getting a, we're making a record of it. Yes, we're making a record and we're making a legacy here as well. You know, I spoke to... Franz Fauré, I believe, a Special Forces Commander. And he said to me one day, because he too has a fascination, it seems, of Lutrefir, Blood River. And he said to me, Chris, you know, if I could just listen to those guys, to hear them discuss what they're going to do, I could have learned so much from them. Because, you know, history is bound to repeat because we don't, we don't listen to history. History is actually extremely important. I always say to people, I... If you want to impress your wife, you know, go make her, well, whatever she likes. Let's, let's say she likes uh, roses. <laughs> but your history is wrong because somewhere somebody wrote she actually likes carnations. <laughs> now you go in good faith and you bring your wife carnations. She's got some bad attitude with carnations. She kicks your ass and she doesn't talk to you for at least two hours. 
point I'm making is, if your history isn't correct, it will kick you in the ass. It's, it's that simple. It's going to bite you in the ass. So it's got to be correct, and you've got to be able to go there and get still silent and think of what actually happened in that place. And your map, your app will actually take us there. So now tell me, if people now want to get hold of this app of yours, what do they do? Do they go to Google Play and, and, and the they go to places? Google? They go to Google Play and they go to iStore and they search for Road Trip SA. The little round black logo with RT on it. And it's, it's findable all over the place. I've got a huge Facebook page. Every day on Facebook, we put up a post about a monument or a site or a something that we found just to keep it going. So on the Facebook page, you'll find the Facebook page. Every single post we've got has got links to download download the app as well. So yes. it's, and, it's, and it's kind of hard. In not... the description. Yeah. We'll, we'll put the, it all... in. And it is updated. I mean, if, if um, it, it's updated constantly, I suppose. The, the app I added, like today I added another 10 spots to the app from one of Dean Allen's books. Like I said, I finished his book today. Um, I saw the other day that uh, Emil added another statue somewhere up in the Eastern Cape of one of the local leaders that has just happened. Um, I've got to at some stage get to Bramfontein Cemetery because they've, they've just, they unveiled a new memorial to the 1922 strike as a general memorial at the gate. We don't have that one yet. It's on the list to go and do, you know, so. <laughs> and we also, <clears throat> sorry, we also expect the people to give good reviews. We don't want to hear nonsense here. You go out, you get this app, five star, and you tell your mate and everyone else, five star, good review. We don't want uh, one uh, wanker you, reviews. You can, you, can, you, can, you, can send, you can send the app via WhatsApp and <laughs> to all your mates, you can go and get it. <laughs> no, that's great. I have to, to smirk here a bit because my wife said to me, look, what are you talking about today with this fellow? And I say, well, I think we're talking history. And says, oh, you won't be home for two hours. <laughs> I said, no, no, off an hour, off an hour. She says, no, I know you. <laughs> <laughs> we, no, you know, it's, it's been it's, fascinating. But it, it is. I mean, like you say, there's lessons to be learned on, on all of these old fights and battles. And what to me is so interesting, when 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 we went across to the UK in, in 95, I managed to organize to spend a weekend with the Territorial Battalion of the Black Watch. Okay, there we go. So I'm now going a weekend exercise with these guys. So we now spend a weekend running around the farms somewhere up near Edinburgh. And... Again, I, I go in there. I'm a, I, was, I was a captain at that stage. And to me, the most interesting thing is, I think the British officers that I've met, and I've met guys who fought in, in the Gulf War. I've met guys who fought in the Falklands. And I, I don't think there's very many armies that produce officers as professional as the UK. These guys are are different level. But yet, when I got there, South Africans are a real rough and ready bunch. Okay? It's a whole different attitude to, to soldiering. And maybe it's our Boer War heritage or something, that it's a much more rough and ready kind of approach to this whole thing. But yet, when I told them I was involved in the border war, they couldn't get enough of it. So they hold us and they hold that border war in unbelievable high regard. And as far as I know, they're now starting to teach the strategies and the tactics and the methods we use in the border war at Sandhurst. They are starting to teach it in the U.S. Because the U.S. Army, I mean, we had what? We had, I think, we our, our ratio of non-combat to combat was something like 6 to 1 or something. I've got somewhere in my memory it was kind of that ratio. Some of these oaks operated like 30 to 1. That's madness. And they're trying to find out how we did that. And how the hell do we send a battle group 3,000 kilometers in 30 days? 3,000 kilometers across Iraq and it's out the other side, man. You know? <laughs> yeah, 
Yeah, that's true. They, they called the commander Little Rommel or something. And uh, they, they can learn a lot from us. Uh, Roland de Vries is doing a lot in the background, General de Vries. Yes. And teaching yes. these people. But let me tell you, I've also met a lot of them. And uh, yeah, they were respectful enough. The ones who were actually the most respectful were the Chinese military officers. But that's another story. What we know here is we've got this app. It's not going to go away. It's not a fly by night. We can download this thing, pay a few rands for it, support you, and uh, enjoy history. And I thank you for doing that. Really, I'm impressed. Thank you. We, we appreciate what uh, you do. Very much appreciate it. Be on your channel. Um, I think I think you're going to be doing an awesome job with, with recording what happened up there as well. Because these are all stories that are going to disappear. Eh? They're all going to go and disappear. And it's they 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 get told on amongst buddies and amongst the old veterans in a pub somewhere, but Joe Public doesn't get to hear them, and Joe Public's got to get these stories as well. <laughs>